Hello and welcome to the Leverhulme Doctoral Scholarship Centre for Water Cultures and our webinar tonight. Uh, so my name's Professor Brian McDonough. Uh, I'm Professor of Environmental Humanities uh, here at the University of Hull uh, in the Energy and Environment Institute. Uh, should we flick on to the next slide, please, Claire and Maria? So welcome. Uh, we're really delighted to have you here this evening. Uh, and our plan today is to tell you a bit uh, about the Leverhulme uh, Doctoral Scholarship Centre for Water Cultures, to introduce you to some of the projects. And you can see our lovely project teams here. They can wave to you from their varying locations. Excellent points for good and cheery waves, folks. Uh, and they will tell you individually uh, about the projects they have on offer this year. Uh, you'll learn too uh, about support for our PGR community, so around training uh, and uh, industry experience opportunities. Uh, and the end of that, we'll have the opportunity for you to ask questions. You can put questions for myself and my colleagues in the questions tab, uh, which you'll find uh, on the webinar. We'll pick them up from there and we'll do our very best to answer as many of them as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. So if we move on to the next slide, uh, we're gonna take the opportunity uh, before we talk individually uh, to show you a film that we made uh, about the center. So when you're ready folks, do we wanna press play on that please? The University of Hull Leverhulme Doctoral Scholarship Centre for Water Cultures is a new interdisciplinary research centre hosted in the University's Energy and Environment Institute. We'll be hosting doctoral scholars from all over the world, working on projects that explore humanity's relationship with water, past, present and future. Doctoral scholars will benefit from a dedicated placement scheme with opportunities to undertake placements of one to three months across a range of national and international water, heritage and creative industry partners. The Green Blue Humanities is a highly original and significant new interdisciplinary research area at the University of Hull that will interrogate cultural responses to and understandings of water in coastal, estuarine and delta regions globally. We will deliver cutting-edge, humanities-led, comparative and trans-historical approaches to living with water. So why is this research needed? Well, today, human-induced climate change is increasing both the likelihood and the severity of floods and droughts. Coastal, estuarine and delta populations in the world's green-blue regions are particularly vulnerable in an uncertain future climate. These are populous yet precarious zones, home to some of the world's largest cities and busiest seaports, yet increasingly prone to extraordinary flooding and unpredictable change. People and societies must learn to live with water. We need to learn from the past, from multiple disciplines, and from Western, non-Western and indigenous water cultures. Engaging diverse communities and building resilience to water stresses and shocks are urgent societal challenges, with the most vulnerable often the least well informed about exposure and mitigation. The Centre for Water Cultures is an interdisciplinary research centre. Doctoral scholars will benefit from access to the EEI's facilities and research environment and from world-class expertise in water-related research in the arts, humanities, social, physical and health sciences. The Centre for Water Cultures offers an unrivalled doctoral training scheme designed to promote open-minded and outward-facing researchers. By working with our doctoral scholars to pioneer a new interdisciplinary area, the Centre for Water Cultures offers scholars a unique opportunity to shape research agendas and develop research solutions that will sustain our cities, communities and cultures of the green-blue regions of the world for generations to come.
So hopefully you've now uh, gained an idea of some of the ambitions and aims uh, of the um, uh, Centre for Water Cultures. Uh, you've learned what we're trying to do and why we want to bring you on board uh, to be part of it. Um, so, uh, as we said in the video, uh, the Centre for Water Cultures explores humanity's relationships with water in the green-blue regions of the world, and we do that past, present and future. We're addressing this crucial, urgent societal challenge and doing it in an interdisciplinary manner. We're training uh, the next generation uh, of humanities-led interdisciplinary and trans-historical PhD students. Uh, and we're kind of bringing people on board, we're building up, we're taking forward uh, the green-blue humanities. So by applying for a PhD project uh, within uh, the Centre for Watch Cultures. Uh, we hope you'll be part of that journey going forward. You'll shape research, you'll build new trans and interdisciplinary ways of working uh, on these topics. Um, the centre is hosted uh, in the Energy and Environment Institute here at the University of Hull, uh, but it involves colleagues from across uh, the universities. So from disciplines as diverse uh, as human geography uh, to health, uh, from uh, studies uh, in uh, slavery and emancipation to history, to English, to physical geography uh, and all sorts of other disciplines. I hope I haven't offended colleagues by failing to quickly mention the discipline that they work in. Uh, but we're working collectively together to design, uh, develop, train and support this next generation of research leaders to work to better understand water cultures in their diverse temporal and geographical context. And the students we have with us already working within the centre are working in a range of time periods uh, from the Mesolithic, uh, so a long, long, long time ago, four and a half thousand years ago or more, uh, to, that's really testing my knowledge on archaeology, I probably shouldn't be talking about that, but a long, long time ago, to the absolute contemporary and present. And as you'll see when some of our colleagues talk tonight, uh, thinking forward into the future. We're working to find solutions and engage diverse communities worldwide in the complex challenges of living better with water in what we know will be a changing climate. And we hope collectively together to pioneer the green blue humanities and equip the next ge generation of researchers to take forward this agenda that we're building through the centre. Can I have my next slide, please? Hopefully it'll click along. There we go. Excellent. Um, so we're focusing collectively our research capacity and our innovation on this kind of critical green blue zone uh, between land and sea. So that muddy, brown, difficult space, uh, that critical zone. Um, together, we're addressing three cross cutting water challenges. So that's around flood and water based disasters. It's around water scarcity, including drought and water supply issues. Uh, and it's around unsafe water, including concerns about wash, so sanitation, about disease uh, and about pollution. Uh, and what I hope you'll learn and what you hope you've already seen through searching people up on the internet, through looking at the web pages for the Centre for Water Culture uh, and the University of Hull, uh, that here at the University of Hull, we're uniquely positioned to develop the green blue humanities. So we're working in a transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary way with colleagues from a range of disciplines in order to kind of bring together the expertise we need in order to push forward these ideas and ambitions. Um, so you'll see some of that here today. You've seen uh, our colleagues. Uh, we'll talk at the end. I'll hand over to Stuart, who will tell you uh, about training within the centre and also about placement opportunities. But if we click on to the next slide for me now, please. Um, here you can see colleagues. So on the screen, you should be able to see both Stuart in a dark and moody room uh, and Tom in a currently being done up uh, office space, subterranean. Um, yes, uh, so they've joined us here today 
They're my co-directors in the center. They themselves come from very different backgrounds. Tom is a physical geographer working on fluvial processes. Uh, Stuart is an English scholar interested in the early modern and together we uh, run the center. Uh, we're currently supporting 12 PGRs at present. We've got six more interdisciplinary projects on offer this year exploring global water cultures through time and space. And we're gonna introduce those projects uh, to you now. So if we click on to the next slide, please. Um, and I'm gonna hand over to Alicia, uh, who's gonna to talk to you uh, about the project that she's inviting applications for this year. Many thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Bryony. Um, I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. So um, I'll, I'll ask Claire if we can move straight on to the next slide, please. So I'm Dr. Alicia Hayes. Um, and I'll tell you more about me in a minute, but I want to start with a bit about the project. So this project is looking at the links between climate related water stresses, migration and human trafficking. So when we're talking about water stresses. We're thinking about things like floods and droughts. And what we're really interested in investigating is how these floods and droughts and water stresses encourage migration. At what point in these stresses? do people need to migrate to find safety? We also want to investigate more about where they go. So depending on where they're from and which country they're in, what are the routes available to them? Which routes do they take and how do they take those routes? Are they on foot? Are they in boats? Um, who helps them? Who supports them to get there? And we're also really interested to know what obstacles are facing them in their journey not only in the process of leaving one place and arriving in another, but also after arrival. So we're not specifically saying we're focusing only on the journey, but we don't know how long temporally this impact of climate related um, water stresses can impact someone's experiences going forward. But we also want to make sure that this project is as interesting as it is, is not just research. We want to use it to invite change on the ground. So we want to use the findings from the project to encourage policy developments. We really want the successful candidate to think about how their findings can um, be used to generate policy recommendations that can be used on the ground to uh, make these routes safer and uh, show better understanding of the situation. And we also want the candidate to work with people with lived experience to generate some creative methods so we can share these lived experiences with members of the public in a more accessible way than them reading a 100,000 word PhD project, which as much as we're going to find it very interesting, perhaps members of the public would be find it less accessible. Can I have the next slide, please, Claire? So just a very quick um, summary of the project team. Uh, it will be me and Professor, Pro Professor Bryony McDonough, who you've already met. So I am based in the Wilberforce Institute at the University of Hull, uh, where all my research focuses on modern slavery and human trafficking. I do a lot of work with practitioners as well, which is why we want to encourage this level of impact and um, ideas of policy development. And um, I won't introduce uh, Bryony more because she's already done such a lovely job. And um, that is a very brief overview of our project, but there will obviously be time for questions and answers at the end. And I'll introduce uh, to Dr. Rachel Williams, who's going to talk about the next project. Thanks so much, Alicia. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Rachel Williams. Uh, I'm a historian. Uh, I work primarily on religion, philanthropy and material culture in the American Civil War. Uh, and my colleague, Professor David Atkinson, who's part of this interdisciplinary um, supervisory team. Hi, David, nice to see you. Um, is a geographer who works primarily uh, on Italy, uh, on themes of totalitarianism, colonialism and memory. So if I could have the next slide, please, Claire. Thank you. Our project is entitled All the Watery Margins, Water and the American Civil War. So we're thinking about not just the practical, but the symbolic uses of water as well. And there's been a, a, a growing interest in environmental histories of this conflict um, in the last of 10 to 15 years or so. Um, but water has really remained fairly peripheral to those discussions. And that is what this, this project is really seeking uh, to address. Uh, and we're particularly interested uh, in the value of interdisciplinary approaches and methods. Um, so thinking about space and movement, um, thinking about public health and approaches to water quality and disease, um, thinking about literary and visual representations of water. We feel that all of these can really help 
us further understand water as a contested resource, um, as a threat, as a refuge, as an obstacle uh, during the conflict. So we all, what we want this project to do is to consider how different groups and participants encountered and understood water. So I've put together some images on the slide demonstrating just how rich and varied uh, those questions might be. So we've got on the top here an illustration um, from a soldier's memoir um, reflecting on the, the kind of restorative power of water, its ability to transcend racial difference. Uh, we've got at the bottom a sketch of uh, two fairly enterprising chaps who've set up a laundry service uh, for their Comrades, if we could move to the next slide, please, Claire. Thanks. I really like this photo here of some um, soldiers taking a refreshing dip in the North Anna River in Virginia. So this was a body of water that, on the one hand, posed danger and challenges to army engineers uh, trying to move troops around. It caused the drowning deaths of, of, of many men. But at the same time, as you can see on the image, it served as a space for um, recreation, for the navigation of male bonding rituals, uh, for ideas about cleanliness and so on. And then the final image is of a memorial fountain in Pennsylvania that was erected about 10 years after the war ended. So the project is also thinking about the symbolic role of water in processes of reconciliation uh, and memorialization after the war. So how did Americans turn to water and to representations of water to articulate how they felt about the conflict and about the, the, the bloodshed and suffering uh, the nation had encountered? So one of the great possibilities of the project that we really want to, to, to stress this evening is the wealth of resources that the candidate would have to draw on, uh, much of which can be accessed remotely, digitally from Hull, uh, but both David and I are experienced archival researchers, so we really want to support our student in planning and conducting sort of targeted archival research at relevant institutions in the US. Um, so thanks very much for your interest in, in the project, I look forward to your questions and I'll hand over now to Stephen. Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Stephen Forrest. I'm a lecturer in flood resilience at the Energy and Environment Institute at uh, University of Hull. My research is really about citizens, governance, and in this case, looking towards the future to try and bridge this uh, theory practice divide. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So the project uh, we're, we're looking at is called Flooded Futures, exploring sci-fi imaginings to develop future flood resilient cities. And as you can see from the slide, there are three different images here. Now, I didn't make them myself. These are AI generated, itself a futuristic technology. You can see here, when we put the question, what would the future city look like and how can it be ready for floods? We've got three very different visions. You can see this, some of them are more sterile, some are very organized. Some are in the middle one is very much thriving. It's very much a more bustling environment. And this project isn't really looking only at what could be, not only the technologies, how our cities will be planned, but also what should be. Issues of fairness, issues of justice, what is the role of the citizen and also the private sector and the government, but how do we design our future cities? We're really looking for an environmental social scientist or a social scientist with an interest in creative writing because this will be a very varied project where you'll be undertaking semi-structured interviews, policy document analysis and literature analysis. So hopefully an interest of sci-fi, or at least that would be beneficial for you. But there'll also be community engagement through these community creative workshops. And an output will be your dissertation, including a chapter of a sci-fi story that you yourself have written. Uh, but also an anthology of community written stories from the workshops and a policy note with recommendations that can be used for policymakers in Hull but also further afield. Next slide, please. And who will be supervising you? Well, we've got quite a broad range of expertise. It'll be myself, and I've got expertise in socio spatial planning, also community engagement and flood resilience, and alternative knowledge forms of knowledge production, such as science fiction. We've got Dr. Edmund Hurst, who's a lecturer in creative writing. He has expertise in fantasy and science fiction writing, as well as leading and facilitating creative writing. So he'll be able to support you on these aspects and also in the community storytelling part. And thirdly, we have Dr. Stuart Mottram, who's also in this webinar. He's a reader in English and he has expertise in climate fiction, literature and the environment, and the role of water out of place. There's Stuart there. So together, we'll be providing you with a lot of support from different perspectives, but you have a really nicely um, interdisciplinary PhD project. 
And on that, I'd like to pass on to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Dr. Richard Meek from English uh, at Hull in the School of Humanities. Um, and this is an interdisciplinary scholarship um, that provides you with an exciting opportunity, I think, uh, for, a, for a doctoral scholar to explore the relationship between two very vibrant scholarly fields, that's the history of emotions and the green-blue humanities. So we can have the next slide, please, with the project title on it. Um, so yeah, the project title is I Am the Sea, Water, Emotion and Geography in Early Modern Literature and culture. And that quotation, I am the sea, comes from Shakespeare's play Titus Andronicus, um, which is a moment of uh, intense emotional distress in which Titus likens uh, himself to the sea. He's affected by the sighs and tears of his daughter Lavinia. Now, uh, traditionally, such moments have been read by critics in relation to humoral theory, the idea that early modern emotions were literally seen as uh, liquid states within the body. And according to those kind of critics, moments like this point to a kind of reciprocity between the body and the environment or the body and the world, to paraphrase Gail Kernpasta. Although I should say that some critics more recently have argued that it's more complex than that and that some of these references to water and the sea should be seen uh, not just or strictly in humoral terms, they should be seen uh, as metaphors, especially in religious and literary texts. Uh, now, at the same time, other cultural historians uh, interested in the early modern period have been interested in concepts of seafaring and hydraulic engineering and how they are used to describe uh, bodies, identities and indeed emotions in the period. So this doctoral scholarship, uh, I think, is a very exciting opportunity to explore these newer forms of what Evelyn Tribble has recently called watery knowledge. So these ideas of seafaring, swimming, navigation, etc. And to use that as a way of, uh, I guess, interrogating or thinking about how early modern writers managed and negotiated the relationship between literal and metaphorical understandings of the sea and the ocean. How did living alongside water in the period shape or complicate understandings of the emotions, identity and selfhood? So we're, we're very interested to, to, to meet a scholar who's from English or history or cultural history interested in these topics. Uh, this is very much an interdisciplinary project in keeping with the history of emotions, I think. And we do have um, a, 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 a exciting, I think, interdisciplinary project team. So we've got the next slide, please. And you can see the uh, team who will be potentially supervising you that there's me myself that's that's uh, me on the on the left but we also have amanda capon who's from history here at hull a senior lecturer in early modern women's history and she has strong interests in uh, emotion and authority and in the humoral system uh, we also have dr damien whiting from philosophy at hull and, and again he has interests in the philosophy of emotion and moral thought in particular uh, and this team at Hull is also joined by Dr. Lawrence Publikova uh, from the Department of English at Bristol. And uh, he's acting as a kind of um, external advisor on the project. And Lawrence has particular interests in Shakespeare and the Sea, and he's published widely on that topic. And he's also interested in dramatic geography and identities. Um, so you'll be supervised by at least two of the people uh, mentioned there. And again, I think it's a very exciting opportunity and we obviously look forward to reading your applications. So thanks very much. And I'll now hand on to the next speaker. And that's Catherine and Kate. Thank you, Richard. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm joined here by my colleague, Dr. Kate Smith, what is, for what is, that's the dog. Uh, what, what is a very kind of, we think, a very exciting uh, initiative, Holy Wells and Springs. Um, uh, so uh, imagine, um, it's the, uh, about the imagination of, of, of water. I want to start by introducing ourselves. So uh, Dr. Smith is a cultural anthropologist and a socio-hydrologist, and she's interested in water and landscape. And she will speak in, in, in a couple of minutes about this project as well, because an aspect of this project will involve um, field work. And that's very exciting for us. I'm an English scholar 
and my interest lies in ideas around the representation and the meanings of viscous landscapes and literature. And what I mean by that, I've done a lot of work on bogs and moors and um, as uh, cultural and political repositories. So what is a well uh, to start with? And I want to start, what, 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 might, what might a holy well look like? And holy wells can be pools that form in clear water, tiny streams, that bubble up from, from rocks to um, emergences from kind of riverbeds. And we often find these holy wells and these springs in areas of spectacular beauty, in groves and forests beside lake sides. They can appear anywhere. And they have this kind of, they, they extend as, 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 air, as, as places of, of devotional practice, they extend over long periods of time, dating back over well over a thousand years. Now, Kate and I have captured some of this because some of this work is really exciting and what we're engaging in is going uh, engaging in field work. So I captured one of these as, as recently as Friday. And the one there on the on the corner here is called Calarigi Holy Well. And this is a holy well in County Leitrim in Ireland, which is is in active use as a place of devotion. There are holy wells, of course, across the British Isles. And one of the exciting dimensions of this project is how we are going to look at this rich cultural heritage and how these these places become traditionally over the centuries have become places of devotion um, and how and more recently i think a re-engagement with these places often these holy wells have been associated um with with pilgrimage within within various kind of religious traditions um in ireland for instance in this context with catholicism but more recently it, we're, we're opening up ideas about how we are engaging with the landscape and this might be within a COVID context or even a post-COVID context what what how are we walking how are we engaging with the landscape what are we seeing and how are we seeing these sites and are we seeing these sites anew so while we're very interested in in the topography and the heritage and the culture and the folklore and we'll be looking at all this uh, through, uh, through our work here um, on this uh, doctoral scholarship we're also interested in the meanings that these places have in contemporary culture as well. So we're taking this kind of historical approach right up into the contemporary and whether these places have changed. What's exciting too about our project is we're not just looking at, they're often these places are associated with what we call the, the Celtic uh, regions, Ireland, Wales and Scotland. We're actually broadening that and thinking about these holy wells in the context uh, of, of the British Isles as a whole and how they might vary. So very exciting for us, this this um uh, much of this work is going to be engaging in kind of in visual production we're going to be we, we're going to examine these wells uh within their kind of current contexts but also kind of locate how they have been described particularly in in in, in archival research in the ways in which uh, folklore has been gathered about these wells and documented um particularly in an irish context is a very rich kind of um uh, literature of the holy well uh, on a website called ducas.ie. So this is something that we'll be kind of engaging with as well, how these have been captured over the course of the 20th century and before, how they how, how they have been kind of examined in terms of the literature. And I'm going to point very briefly to a holy well in Wales called St. Winifred's. And St. Winifred's has been a, a, a place of, of, of pilgrimage over several centuries which has attracted the kings of England to this place uh, from, from, from Henry V to before that to Richard the Lionheart, and also has produced um, a body of poetry through the work of Jared Manley Hopkins. So there's a rich cultural diversity about these places. So I'm going to hand you over now to Kate to talk a little bit more about the fieldwork aspects of our project. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so I, I have the job I have now because of Holy Wells. So I have moved from uh, my PhD research was in folklore studies and cultural anthropology. And I have moved across from that into environmental humanities because that was really the, the stuff I was most interested in. And I am lucky to be uh, an, working within the EEI, the Energy and Environment Institute now, because I've had this long standing interest in water and the landscape and the way that these wells are actively curated by contemporary communities. So the picture on the right is my local holy well that I've been documenting for several years. And that used to be, uh, it used to be part of the, the 
East Yorkshire railway line. It's on it's on a railway line and it used to be where the steam engines filled their tanks up. So it's gone from being a really industrial site to now being a site with a, a rag tree that people leave tokens and gestures in uh, to being a site of kind of communing with with the spirits of nature and there's a there's a shrine to the, the suffering of nature alongside it and this is an actively curated site that is very much part of people's current experience of engaging with the landscape as it is now so yeah they as well as the archival work that Catherine's mentioned and we benefit hugely from the fact that in the Republic of Ireland they have a fantastic folklore archive as well as all the literary stuff that you can get your hands on that's complemented with contemporary fieldwork working in the East Yorkshire area where there are numerous springs and also further afield. And this is this is research that really needs to be done because there's there's relatively little known about um, the the use and the the experience, the lived experience of people engaging with these this water in the landscape in contemporary England. There are lots of wells out there. A lot of them have been covered up or or forgotten about. So it'd be really, really good to have a proper robust academic understanding of what's going on and it's a PhD that I'd quite like to go back and do myself actually which I think is always a good thing so I've got lots of experience of doing uh, field work in in various contexts uh, complemented with Catherine's extensive uh, archival and literary work I think we have a, a really exciting prospect and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens and I think we have one more slide that we've probably already covered most of, and then I think we're on to the next, uh, the next proposition. Thank you, Catherine and Kate. So it's me again, folks, uh, and uh, this time talking to you about the project that I'm advertising uh, within the centre this year. So the past uh, few years, I have uh, led the centre, but not uh, directly advertised a PhD. So this is quite exciting uh, for me. So can we click on to the next slide, please, folks? Uh, so the project that I'm advertising this year is called Creative Community Engagement for Climate and Water Action. So we know under all of the IPCC scenarios uh, that the frequency, intensity and severity of both flood and drought hazards uh, will increase in parts of Eastern England uh, and in parts of uh, the North Sea littoral uh, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in parts of Denmark, uh, in the, our changing climate future. So how do we go about building resilient communities in places that have at times too much water, that face uh, flooding, and at times increasingly too little water? Uh, so we know parts of the Netherlands in recent years uh, have faced really quite significant drought. So what does it look like? What do we do in these places that means we can build community resilience to both flooding and to drought? So in this project, we'll be building on the successes of two other recent projects, and that's Risky Cities uh, and Magic. You can see some photos from those projects here of the arts projects that we've been involved in. Uh, and in both Risky Cities uh, and in Magic, we're looking at how we build community resilience to flood. But what we want to do in this PhD, in comparative perspective, is look at drought and look at what we can do by way of creative community engagement for climate action uh, in these locations. So the successful candidate for the PhD uh, will explore place-based creative approaches that can drive climate action and engagement. You'll work collaboratively with communities and stakeholders uh, in your chosen case study areas in order to support those communities and stakeholders chosen climate solutions. So it's about working with community, building from the bottom up and using creative approaches to work out what communities want and need for their climate future and to look at how we can build resilience through the arts in those circumstances. So through Risky Cities, we've engaged with a range of creative and participatory methods. That's included creative writing of the kind that Stephen talked about a little bit earlier. It's included theatre. So you can see uh, Kate and I here uh, at COP26 in Glasgow with colleagues from the National Youth Theatre. Uh, we put on a piece of theatre, piece of live performance uh, at COP. 
which was exploring young people's responses to living uh, with flooding in coastal communities. Um, and at the top of the page, you can see uh, some shots from floodlights. That was a project exploring living with water past, present and future in the city of Hull uh, using uh, large scale public art. So this is some imagery that was projected onto a building, uh, an ex uh, a nautical school in the city uh, as part of that project. So we want the person who comes in to work on this project to use some of those methods or other methods. It might include storytelling, it might include visual arts or other relevant creative practices. Uh, and also use a range of participatory methods to evaluate the work that they do. So it's going to be about using creative arts of your choice in order to try and drive climate action in relation in particular to drought. We have some ideas what works in terms of flood resilience, but what can we do in terms of drought resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in doing this, you'll be working with myself uh, and my very fabulous colleague, Jill Hughes. Uh, he's a lecturer in education uh, here in the Faculty uh, of Arts, Cultures and Education. She's got a long history of community development work, community engagement work, uh, and she'll be working alongside myself and the successful candidate to supervise uh, and uh, support the project uh, to allow you to bring your ideas uh, to the project uh, and to work in comparative perspective so both in the UK uh, and uh, internationally either in Europe or elsewhere we're open to ideas uh, coming to the table about what would work well and um, so that concludes the six projects on offer you've met all of our supervisors you can just click on to the next slide, please. Great, and I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Stuart Mottram, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit about other stuff going on within the centre. Many thanks, Stuart. Thanks very much, Bryony, and I uh, hope you can all hear me okay. Um, so we've, we've, we've heard for some fantastic projects, uh, and I uh, hope you've had a really good sense of the, the kind of range of both kind of geographical range, the temporal range, and also the, the disciplinary range of the projects we have uh, on offer at the Centre for Water Cultures uh, this year. Um, could I have the, the next slide, please? Uh, and I just want to talk you through, thanks very much, just want to talk you through some, some of the, the other opportunities we have at the Centre beyond um, the, the projects themselves. And I'll be talking for just a couple of minutes on this, and then we'll, we'll go to the, the, the important section of the webinar where we'll be answering some of your questions. And I realise We've got a number, of, uh, a number of questions already come in, uh, but while I'm talking, if you do want to type any uh, your questions into uh, into the, uh, the, the box, uh, then we'll, we'll address those in a moment. So interdisciplinarity is really key to the Centre for Water Cultures, uh, and it's it's key to the uh, to the sort of the, the makeup of the projects as we've as we've as we've seen. So all the projects have supervisors come from different disciplines. It's also key to to how we um, we, we support. Uh, our PhD scholars in the centre. Uh, and so um, first and foremost, um, our, our scholars, are, 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 are they have their home in the Energy and Environment Institute, which is a, a sort of stylish, state-of-the-art and also sustainable building uh, on campus. Um, within that, um, our, our scholars have access to desk space, uh, to laptops, and importantly, also to the range of activities that we offer at the centre. Um, so Bryony mentioned at the start that we've got a growing community of scholars uh, already at the centre, and, and we were really delighted to uh, listen to um, uh, papers about their, about their projects before Christmas. We had our first postgraduate uh, conference uh, where everyone spoke and it was a fantastic day. We learned a lot about everyone's projects, and I learned a lot uh, also. We're doing those annually, so we'll have one, we'll have one uh, certainly uh, by, um, by, by, by this time next year, uh, if not before. Uh, and we're also, uh, as well as the conference, we have fortnightly uh, sessions with, with, all our, with, all, with, with, with all our scholars, uh, skill sessions, uh, catch-up sessions. Uh, we have things like we have, for example, I run a, um, uh, Sense for Water Cultures book group, uh, where, where we, we look at some of the climate fiction, some of the, some of the stuff, for example, that Stephen was talking about earlier in his project. Uh, and 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 so uh, through those, we not only kind of I, I think 
it enriches the experience of everyone at the centre, but also I think facilitate conversations across disciplines uh, and and get everyone talking about their interests and how they how they interrelate. So we have the we have the Energy and Environment Institute, we have we have the the, the activities, uh, and then also um, another kind of raft, as it were, that's supporting uh, our scholars is the um, is the postgraduate training scheme. Every PhD uh, um, PGR uh, student at the uh, university um, um, will, will enroll on on a postgraduate training scheme. It's very important um, skills training as part of as part of their degrees. Uh, at the Centre for Water Cultures, one module that you will take on that uh, is the industry placement, and this uh, is is key to um, to to training uh, uh, not only uh, um, our, our scholars, not only as academics uh, as researchers within their particular areas of interest, but but thinking about um, about the future, about about training uh, for for careers, and also in terms of having a sort of outlook beyond academia uh, for what uh, a postdoctoral uh, career might look like. So everyone, uh, every scholar has um, an opportunity to take a, a, a placement of between one to three months at an organisation of your choice. And while we call this an industry placement, it need not necessarily be kind of the hard industries uh, that, 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 you, that, that you are um, based at. For example, um, we are fortunate in Hull um, this is obviously a sense for water cultures, but but Hull is itself a, a, a place of, of of water culture and has a rich history of maritime um, heritage, for example, of living with water in various ways across its eight hundred year history. There's lots of organisations in and around the city, heritage organisations, museums, galleries, and so forth that you can um, that, that are that are interested in water from from a range of different cultural angles. So an industry placement scheme uh, that that will um, that will sit alongside your project, complement it, but not necessarily be directly related to it uh, as part as part of your um, your four year um, degree program. Finally, and just to mention another way that we support our scholars uh, and of course also think about the future, think about what's happening after your PhD is through our mentoring program, where as well as, as well as the interdisciplinary supervisory team, you will also be assigned someone, a mentor from, from um, outside, out with that team, um, who, who, can, uh, who is available um, to, to introduce you to different, um, different uh, disciplinary areas um, and networks within, within those areas, uh, and also uh, someone to think about um, to talk about the future uh, and what that might look like for you. So we're we're hopefully enriching your experience as a as, as a scholar at the centre and thinking about the future at the same time. So I hope that's given you a really good insight in, into some of um, in some of what we offer at the centre uh, and uh, as as well as the projects. And now we have about 15 minutes available uh, for questions. So we could have the next slide um, while we're um, while we're answering these questions. Uh, there is a QR code there which will take you directly to our website. On the website there are uh, links to each of the projects that you've heard from today uh, and, um, and so uh, let's, uh, let's, um, let's start answering some of these questions. We have uh, quite a few uh, so um, I will um, um, some of these are specific to um, the, uh, the particular projects. So let's start with some general ones and then we'll hand them out to individuals. So I've had a quick look. I can see there are questions uh, about international applicants uh, and also about subject expertise. So I can pick off there and then we'll hand some others out to other people. So um, one uh, attendee asks, are these projects open to international uh, applicants? Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, we all of our projects are open to international applicants. Um, the successful applicant uh, for these projects uh, would get, in the case if they were international, would get the stipend as laid out uh, in the advert, uh, but both UK and international fees paid for them. So international fees are more expensive than UK fees. Um, 
or fees for international applicants are more expensive. Um, so for successful applicants, we were able to support a number of international applicants. Um, it almost certainly wouldn't be that we had uh, six international uh, scholars, uh, but we can certainly support both international and UK scholars within the scheme. So you are absolutely 100% open to apply if you are an international scholar. Uh, you will need to make that clear as part of your application process, uh, but uh, that comes into play later on uh, in allocating projects, so please don't let that put you off. Uh, there's also a question uh, about subject expertise. Is this, uh, hi, want to ask if other fields can apply for the PhD or if it's only for the sciences? I think that was asked fairly early on, actually. So hopefully this has become clear in going uh, through the projects in meeting the supervisory teams who you now see arranged very nicely on your screen. Uh, yes, 100%. This is not about the sciences. This is about international uh, and interdisciplinary rather collaboration. So all of our project teams uh, draw on uh, supervisory teams from across the arts and humanities and involving the sciences. So yeah, definitely not only the sciences. And you will see there's several questions about, you know, is this particular master's or is this particular undergraduate degree uh, relevant to particular PhD projects? So in all of the PhD adverts, um, you will see the um, uh, disciplines that we're looking for. It usually says things like English, history or related disciplines. So absolutely, if you've got a PhD in or rather you've got a master's or an undergraduate degree in a discipline that's broadly related to the area you want to apply to, we'd absolutely encourage you to apply. So much as Kate has just talked about being a cultural anthropologist now working in an environmental institute, many, many of us have come on varied and diverse career paths. Uh, so if you've got something that's relevant, if you've got skills that are relevant to the project, please do apply. Don't get put off by the idea that you specifically haven't got this PhD. And many of them, because they're interdisciplinary, there was a question too about, you know, my previous experiences in this field, should I still apply when I my interests map to a particular part or a particular supervisor, but not to the whole project? Um, absolutely. You know, these are exciting interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary projects. There are not many people in the world who will have had an undergraduate degree that dealt with both climate migrate, climate and migration, with both cultural methods and with English. So it's all right. You know, you apply, uh, you make the expertise you've got as relevant as possible, uh, and that's the joy and the exciting bit of applying to and being within a transdisciplinary uh network right i'm reading quite they're now coming in thick and fast flicking up on our on our screen so, Bonnie, i think i think there's, some, there's a there's a question about part-time whether or not these uh, projects are available for part-time applicants yeah. yeah um so the situation from our funder is it the projects are advertised full-time um so at this point in time uh, all of our projects are advertised on a full-time basis because of the conditions of our funding. Um, that I think the situation would be that if people started full-time and then they had a really significant life change that meant they had to move to part-time, we would be able to support that. But at least in the first instance, all of our projects uh, are advertised uh, on a full-time basis. Um, I can also see somebody asking, for international students, how many years do they have to live in the UK? Uh, well, we hope you would want to come to the University of Hull to be part of the research culture here. I'm a strong believer in the fact that to benefit from and get the most out of the degree, you need to be present at the university. But for all of our projects, there are or by far and large the majority of them, there is some element of field work. Uh, so that might, in some cases, be field work in a relatively local sense. Uh, in others, for example, in my project, it's likely that you will be doing international field work uh, as part of the opportunity. That might also be the case for uh, several of the other projects. So we would uh, need you to be present in Holland to be part of the research culture. We should be clear that the PhD opportunity is for four years funding. Uh, so many PGR degrees are three years. We're in a really lucky position to be advertising four-year degrees. That gives you the opportunity to engage in the enrichment activities that Stuart introduced you to, 
uh, to undertake your industry uh, opportunity or placement uh, and to do a range of things like being involved in conferences, publishing uh, and the like as part of the opportunity. Uh, but it is a four year degree. We do expect you to be present in Hull, uh, except where you are away on field work, which might be for a relatively extended period uh, for, um, for some projects. Um, right, we have we have a number of questions about whether or not it's possible to apply for more than one of these projects at the same time. No, you need to apply for a single project. So pick your favourite one uh, and apply for that one, please. I can see somebody asking about start dates as well. Uh, so the start dates are September 2023 for all six projects. Uh, other questions, Stuart, that you can see? There's a question about the precise deadline, um, whether it's 30th of January, 12 p.m. GMT, or... Yes, please, we are. I'm mentally working out if we are in GMT. Yes, we are. I, I was just uh, wondering, so I think we are. We are still you, till March. You, UK <laughs> time, midnight, end of the 30th, please. Yes, for absolute clarity. Um, there's a question of, um, to... I think about whether or not what are the essential elements that we're looking for in a PhD project proposal. Uh, that's a... so, yeah, so um, the projects exist. People need to be aware of that. So the projects are advertised. The application process isn't that you write a PhD proposal in the way that you would if you were seeking um, to get a self-funded PhD to the university. There's an application form. It asks you about how you might develop the project. It asks you about your motivations for being involved. There's three or four different questions and there's a word limit in doing that. I can't remember all of those questions off the top of my head, uh, but you're not writing a proposal for this project. The projects exist. Uh, you're responding to the project and thinking about how you might develop it and what particular skill sets you are, you bring to the project and what your motivations are. Um, there were some uh, specific questions for particular specific questions colleagues. For we try and answer some of those. Yeah, I think I just I'm just going through some of the more general ones as well. I think hopefully I've answered this uh, addressed this question about whether or not students have the opportunity to connect with advisors beyond their own project. Or, I, I hope hopefully I've, I've addressed that. Um, the answer is very much yes. Uh, we, we 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 encourage uh, communication and conversation uh, across all the. Um, across all the projects and um, through the activities we, we offer. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, uh, I can some see questions question. about whether or not the, the presentations will be made, the, the presentation will be made available, we're, we're making the recording available um, yeah. uh, as, as, as soon as we have the link um, to send. I can see a question for, or a couple of questions for Alicia actually. Um, so for the project on water stress and human trafficking, uh, do you have particular regions, areas, countries in mind to be studied for the project? Uh, and would uh, Southeast Asia be suitable, for example, uh, in the Mekong River? Yep, just very quickly, I know I'm conscious of time. Um, one of the things we stipulated in the project is we're interested in uh, the experience of people who are now in the UK. But that's it in terms of where they came from. That's totally up to um, the successful candidate to decide. Right. Thank you very much. There's a similar question about working in Africa, but I think the same answer uh, applies. Um, I'm flicking through. Um, I think there's quite a few for um, Stephen um, on flooded futures, and I'm just trying to sort of curate them together. Um, I think one is how would the completed uh, final draft of a dissertation for the flooded futures project look like? Um, as in we'll know in about four years. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, I mean, well, I suppose that the answer to that is also a, um, an answer for, for all projects, really, which is that um, there is a, obviously an opportunity for the, the particular scholar on these projects to develop the projects uh, in conversation with their supervisors in the way that they feel the research should be developed. Um, so I think there isn't a, a set structure at, at, this, at, at this point. Uh, as to what the um, as to what the final dissertation um, uh, thesis will look like, um, it's very much um, obviously uh, research is um, by its nature 
uh, unexpected and unknown uh, at the outset. So, oh, aware that we're running out of scheduled time, and then a lot of specific questions for the different projects, I'd really encourage um, applicants or people who are interested in certain projects to get in touch with the relevant supervisors that you can see on the. No, system. just just for clarity, Tom, applicants need to email watercultures at hull.ac.uk. Don't email individual supervisors, um, and then those questions can be directed on. But really importantly. At the University of Hull, we operate a uh, quality, diversity uh, and inclusion basis. So supervisors will be making decisions on your application without your name attached to it. So it's really important that you apply to email water cultures. Our very brilliant admin team can then find out the answer to your question my, if you know to be specific. Right. That's all right. Um, and then, but we will, uh, for very good reasons, be blind sifting in order to ensure the best possible kind of fairest possible highest quality um, recruitment process. Uh, so any questions, water cultures, but if it is specific, absolutely. You can email it there and then we will follow it up and we will find out the answer to the question. Uh, thanks so much, folks. Um, right, there's a question here which is specific to flooded futures, but I think has wider applicability, which is for, um, and Steve, this is about whether or not the project uh, could could look at sites beyond the UK, such as Asia. Um, I, I think the answer is is yes, and that's obviously to be discussed. But uh, the the question I think, which has wider applicability, is um, will there be funding to travel to to, to countries out, outside the UK to gather data? Brian, is it worth just mentioning something about the um, about the the annual bursary uh, which is available? Yeah, so for all of our students in um, the uh, Centre for Water Cultures, uh, there are travel uh, travel support. Uh, so that means there's a thousand pound per annum uh, to go and do an international conference, uh, to purchase resources should you need access to a particular web resource or the like. Uh, that can be also used to support uh, international field work. Obviously, that isn't going to be the amount that supports six months uh, of field work uh, in a uh, overseas region. Uh, what we do encourage you to do is to apply alongside that money uh, to support from other sources. So that includes the doctoral college here at the university that can support um, overseas uh, travel. It includes things like uh, the Royal Geographical Society uh, in the UK that can support uh, international field work. It includes various other sources uh, of funding. And where we've occasionally had PGRs with uh, costs that are beyond, above and beyond uh, that, we have been able with negotiation where we've known there's a particularly expensive project. We've got uh, a PGR at the moment uh, working on paleo environmental uh, project and radiocarbon dates are really expensive. So we have been able to make some additional allowance to support his costs. So yes, there's support, but yes, we would also support you to apply uh, for other opportunities for funding. Uh, the question I think specifically for Stephen, but you can answer more widely on behalf of the people, uh, was you've mentioned policy outcomes. Alicia said the same, the same is true of my project. Are we intending those a UK only or do they have international applicability? Uh, it's a really nice question and I think it's uh, really important to think not only about the theoretical perspectives and the projects which is being done here, but to try and bridge it to practice and practitioners, not only within Hull and in the UK, but also more globally, if applicable. So I think for a lot of people, we're trying to see how much impact we can get from the research that you're doing so that it can actually be used in practice as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one or two questions here about what I said about blind sifting, asking if we should not mention, if applicants should not mention uh, relevant experience. So when you apply, you're told really clearly which information not to include. Uh, obviously, um, that's within the application form itself. The CV, of course, contains that information and we understand uh, and appreciate that. Uh, so there's really clear guidance online. Uh, but yes, if if your experience as well, it's not about excluding your experience. It's just about ensuring that we believe that the best possible kind of application process is one in which uh, we are doing our initial sift, our initial shortlisting 
uh, without access to information about your nationality, your name, your age, your gender, uh, and various other things. So we want to try and ensure we have the best possible level playing field and to recognize competencies within our applicant rather than access to particular uh, kind of high high achieving schools or universities. So it's important we look beyond that information. Um, great. Um, a couple of very There's specific a quick question questions. About, about placements, which I can just answer very quickly, which is how yes, much of right. an idea of what how much of an idea of what placements interest us should we have before applying? Well, obviously, if you have some some strong ideas, um, then then would be would be grateful to hear them. But but, but there's no absolutely no um, that there's there's no need to or, or it, it's it's not in any way part of our um, um, our um, selection process uh, that that you already have a placement uh, in mind. Um, so so please don't feel that you have to have a placement in mind before you apply. Absolutely. And there's a couple of very specific questions. There's one. Um, on the application form, we can identify areas which we'd like training in. Is there a risk that this could be seen as a weakness in the application? Um, I think we'd encourage you to be straightforward. If you think you absolutely need so much training that you haven't got experience in any of the subject areas that the PhD is working in, then perhaps it's not the PhD project for you. But you're being asked to identify are the particular training needs, you know, have you got lots of experience in this area and this area, but you would need support to do this? And given that they're interdisciplinary, cutting edge projects, it will necessarily be the case that our candidates will come without experience of absolutely everything that is in the project. It wouldn't be a very exciting PhD project if you already knew how to do it nine months before you started. Uh, so it's a question about being realistic about what your training needs might be, but it, you don't need to know all of those answers now, but you might need to say, okay, I've got lots of expertise in this and this, but I don't at the moment have much expertise in working in X. So for previous years, people have said, I know an awful lot about paleo environmental. I know how to do that, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't have a lot of experience working with archives from which I might gain data to know where to do my paleo environmental coring. Uh, and that that we've supported that the candidate in question, um, you know, has now had a whole load of training on working with archival materials to identify field sites. So that's that's OK. And um, we are now over time, but we appreciate your interest and enthusiasm. Stuart, were there any other easy questions we can answer? I think we have by and large answered what I can see uh, in the chat. Um, I don't I'm think conscious really... that if we haven't answered your question, uh, we will, after this, um, just, you know, uh, go through the questions and make sure that um, uh, we, we've, we've addressed. I, I I'm apologise if we haven't specifically addressed your question, but I hope that some of the more generic answers we've given um, have, have been helpful. Um, Absolutely. So in that case, we will thank uh, everybody mu very much for their time in joining us. I can see, se I think I saw 70 something people who joined us. So that's really fantastic. We're going to thank our really brilliant panel members for giving up uh, their evening in their home. Uh, and those of you who are still at work, I can tell I'm still at work, uh, will be released uh, to go home and have your tea, UK time. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks to our panelists uh, and our very brilliant behind the scenes people for making the slides work and for supporting me even when I could neither see nor hear the video. So thank you ever so much folks for joining us. Uh, great to see people uh, and we welcome your applications. So do please get in touch, watercultures at hull.ac.uk. If you've got specific questions that still need answering, as Stuart says, we'll try and pick some of these up from the chat uh, and make sure we answer them to uh, more specifically, uh, and otherwise, we'll look forward to your app and applications due on the 30th of January, folks. Thank you very much indeed. Bye bye, everyone.